Good morning, Connect. So I'm really excited to be here and to share with you, and I have um, really sought the Lord this week. Um, Chad asked me on Tuesday <laughs> if I would preach, and I um, said yes, but he was really confident that there was something in the arsenal, and I was not as sure as him, but I, that makes you get on your face harder, right? <laughs> when you're not quite sure what God's up to. But I am confident this morning in what God has spoken. I am confident that he is sounding an alarm right now in this time that we're in um, for what he wants to do in the world through us. We're not just spectators. God's inviting us into what he's doing, and we've got to be ready. And so I'm preaching at my favorite place in the world, um, I've served at a lot of churches, and I love them all. They all have great things, but this is home, and we are a family that God has brought together. Um, and so this morning, I want you to keep that in mind. I think sometimes it's so easy to go to church as just a, du a duty. <laughs> I hate saying it that way, or just something that we do because it's a habit, and we do this, and we know it's important, and we love God. But we fail to understand that when we come corporately together to seek God, God himself, he comes down different. And so I believe today, I'm already seeing God moving, and worship was amazing, right? Let's, like, give the thanks to the worship team. Thank you. Like, God was using you. And people are responding, which is amazing. So we're off to a really good start this morning. So I'm just going to ask you to be able to be completely open and vulnerable, which is not always our greatest gift. Um, so be open because I just believe that God has a word that may sound hard. Like when you first hear it, you're like, ugh. And I'm just like asking you not to shy away. Asking you to keep an open mind. I've been praying for your minds and your hearts this week that they'd be soft and that your minds would be clear and free of distraction because Satan's real good at that. That we'd be thinking about the next thing or, or justifying like, what we're listening to about somebody else, it's not applicable to you, but it might be to your neighbor, you know, something like that. But it's applicable to every single one of us. So I'm just going to stop you right there with that thought, and we're going to get into the Word of God together. So I am calling Code Blue. This is a spiritual Code Blue call for every single one of us, for Christians um, here in this church, but really, I believe globally, Maybe specifically right now in my heart, it's towards like the Western civilization of, of our Christianity and, and how we view church and interact with God. But anybody who's in the medical field, and we have medical professionals that are in and out of this church all the time, and they know when cold blue is called in a hospital or in a medical setting, it's like go time, right? We don't have time to waste. Somebody might die, <laughs> essentially. That's what it is. And for all of us non-medical professionals, is like code blues for, you know, cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest. But either way, it's a big deal. So if we're calling a spiritual code blue, it is serious and there is no time to be wasted. And... I find it interesting that when there is cardiac things going on, so often you will hear um, somebody say, like, well, I just had my arm hurt for a bit, or I had headaches, or I just didn't feel right. And then all of a sudden they're in over their head, and they're knocking on death's door, and medical teams are doing everything they can, right? Because there had been, like, these slow little signs that they didn't take serious. Or maybe the opposite happened and it was just like literally all of a sudden, everything shut down. In one way or another, it is extreme. And this morning, I believe the condition of our hearts are in extreme need of attention. And again, this isn't necessarily this church, but it is us as individual Christians serving the living God that need to look at symptoms, that need to look at things in our lives that may or may not be quite right. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And so whether you are a football fan at all or um, you're a diehard, it doesn't really matter, but you all have heard about Damar Hamlin. <laughs> you can't really turn on any type of media right now without hearing about him. So, you know, he is the player that collapsed on Monday night. 
He is 24 years old. He's fit, he's healthy, he's strong. He is not a candidate for a heart attack, right? And of course, how the, the hit that he took and the impact and all of that, that had everything to do with what happened to him. But what that should be telling us is that our days are numbered, right? None of us know exactly when our time is going to run out. And thank God for his mercy and for his grace over Damar. And he is, you know, on the long, long road to recovery. And we're so thankful for that. And what's so interesting about this whole entire thing is that God has put himself on a pedestal nationally and even beyond right now. And why? Because when no one knew what to do, you saw a giant field of players hit their knees. You saw ESPN hosts stop everything and pray live on air for Damar. Like that's significant, church. And we should be excited about this because this is our moment. We sit and we pray like, God, hopefully, like show yourself, show yourself. He's showing himself faithful. You had thousands of people praying for this man, and then you see God answer it, right? He's in it. And one of the things that's really cool is that, um, and to be honest, like, I, don't, I don't know a lot about Damar. <laughs> to be honest, I think most of us probably didn't until now. Um, so I can't tell you if he's a spirit-filled man. I don't know. I have inclination that there's probably a relationship there before all of this, but um, what I find interesting is in the first post that he made thanking people and, and kind of expressing his thoughts after this incident, it said, on my long road to recovery, keep praying for me. Like he's recognizing that this was a move of God that saved his life for such a time as this and put God on a pedestal. Now's our moment, church. Now is our time. We should be ready to lead the charge in the public eye. We should be the ones that know how to pray. We should be the ones that are bold enough to know what to do next when these things happen because we have been chosen by God, empowered by God, and we should be in a position where we believe that our prayers move heaven. And it's amazing and we can get excited about that, but my question is, are we really ready for it? And the telltale sign of, are we ready to lead the charge, is consistently based upon our intimacy with God. And so we're going to talk about the Israelites today. They will forever always be the best examples of human beings that there has ever been and ever will be. Because... The Israelites were God's chosen people. He chose an entire nation out of all the people in the world and said, these are my people. Like, I dwell among them. I have good for them. And I want to be close to them. And I'm going to lead them. And I'm going to be their God. He rescued them from Egypt. These people got to see a pillar of fire and a cloud and follow God through the desert. Then he fed them every day by his own hand, and when they got really whiny about manna, he brought them meat to their door. They didn't have to like go looking, he provided. They saw him split an ocean and walk through it. And I don't know about you, but for me, I, if you can show me that you can split the ocean and then you can get nations, this isn't like we're talking like hundreds of people like we see on the show. An entire nation worth of people, men, women, children, animals, through it before the enemy who is on a mission to kill and destroy could get to them. If you can do that, I'm on your team. Like, I'm, my devotion is to you. We are going places together. Like, you say jump, I'm jumping. And so they saw all of this. And yet, there are 17 books in the Bible written in detail about their struggle with sin and the consequences of that and God's warning to come back to him. Why? Because the human heart is prone to wander. Our human condition consistently wants what we want when we want it. We struggle with who we are. 
when we look at everything around us, which is something that is one of Israel's biggest downfalls, is wanting to be like everybody else, and we consistently struggle with sin. And so we have these books that are called the books of the prophets. Keep in mind, 17 books, there's only 66 in the Bible. That's a significant amount of God showing the seriousness of sin and the effects that it has on the human. And so we're going to take a look at one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I like, I wish we could read the whole thing. I was like talking to Dylan as I was preparing and I'm like, but you have to see the whole picture to get it. And I'm, it's a lot of like wordy, heady stuff because they're describing a vision or several visions that this prophet keeps having. And if I rapid fired you at that, like your brains would explode and you'd have no clue where we were or why we were talking about this. So I'm gonna try and sum up fairly quickly for you what was happening back in the days of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel was not the first prophet that was sent to warn them and to tell them to come back to, come back to God. And at the point in which Ezekiel was asked to be God's voice, God was done. Like he wasn't playing anymore. He was done warning. And he was very, very serious about the sin that was happening around them. They were defiling the temple. There was tons of sexual immorality. Um, there was a lot of trying to copy the outside nations so that they looked like somebody else in, in, in not living set apart. And so what God told Ezekiel to bring to these people was simple. I'm going to push you out even further. These people were already exiled. A lot of them had been scattered because of their sin. And you would think being scattered and removed from, from the blessing and the favor would be reminder enough of who your God is, but it wasn't. So at this point, God says, I'm going to drive you out further. A lot of you are going to die by the sword. If you don't die by the sword, you're going to die by the plague. And if you don't by, die by plague, you're going to die by famine. It's pretty simple, right? That was the anger of God. And what we all know that God's a just God, correct? And justice is served when we recognize that there is a wrong, there is a consequence for that wrong, right? So you have all of these people doing wrong, so there is a consequence to their action. But what I love about the Lord is there's always an unless. You know, he's been begging, come back to me, come on, come back, come back, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, come back, come back, come back, but they're thick-hearted, thick-headed, they're not doing it. Ezekiel actually, the description God gives him about the Israelites is that they're a rebellious people, and they're probably not going to listen to you. That's what God said about his own people. They're rebellious. Rebellious is not an action. It is a heart, heart posture. It's not just us making bad decisions. It's us intentionally making bad decisions. We know what to do, but we don't want to do it. Either we're lazy, we're inconvenienced, it might make us look bad, whatever. Your list could be long. Your list could justify your behavior, but it's rebellion. So God is saying this about his own people in this instance. He's telling Ezekiel... They're probably not going to hear you, but I don't care because the message needs to be given. That this is their time. Come back to me. And I love God's unless. I love it because I don't always have unlesses. Unless you do this. Um, I, my gift that is divinely given to me is not mercy. Um, I have to walk in that. I have to ask for that day in and day out. Um, and, but it's not my natural. I am not eager to be like, it's fine. It's good. And point out all the good things about you um, when you are not doing what I say, if you're my child. <laughs> you know, you've gone over it and over it. You're like 15 times in and they're still not doing it. And it's just getting bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden there's chaos. And I'm just like, okay, done. Like, there's no, unless you come back to me. <laughs> and uh, 
they don't care. <laughs> they just don't care. My kids have a heart of rebellion because we all have it, right? Our kids are great mirrors. And anyway, God has an in-less, and that's what I love about him. So we're going to take a look at the b- Ezekiel 11, and we're actually going to start at 16. Because this is a good picture of, we have God saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Come back to me. <laughs> and this is why. And this is what I love. Therefore say, thus says the Lord, and this is God talking to Ezekiel, so that Ezekiel knows what to say to the people. Thus says the Lord God, though I remove them far among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, They will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord pretty black and white there (laughs) and what I love is that God is craving to give mercy to his people he's not just saying like oh you're all bad we're all done he's giving hope I want to bring you back close to me where you belong I want to give you a heart that wants to obey me and to follow me but what's your job you're going to come back and you're going to get rid of all the detestable things do you see that there's an action piece there that yes, God gives a new heart. God does the, does the internal, but we have a job. Remove the detestable things. And so he's going he's gonna to do that. But if you don't, I will bring your deeds on your own head. So who this morning, looking at the fact that this is the wrath of God talking, I know that I serve the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I know that that's still a characteristic of who he is. Who here this morning recognizes that you should be real grateful for Jesus? Because that same judgment passed on the people of Israel is what is passed on you and me. When we are outside of Jesus, that is what we have in store for us. But instead, God sent Jesus the perfect Lamb of God, with the perfect relationship to the Father that God knew he would have to turn his back on and pour out that type of anger for every person who has ever lived and ever will live, that's a lot, on one man. Watch him be tortured, spit on, mocked, beat, hung on a cross, die, and then turn his back on him. For people with rebellious hearts who may or may not ever fully give their everything to him. That was the sacrifice. And what, what I'm a little bit afraid of, and when I say this, I've checked my heart, and I, and I ask God will continue daily to continue to check it. But we're so thankful for Jesus because that wrath should be ours but we don't always live like that. We rely on a cheap sort of grace. And that grace says, oh, Jesus forgave my sins. Like, I'm going to heaven. God's so good. But I'm going to live like I want. Because I'm not intentionally recognizing what was sacrificed so that I could be covered. That I am so loved, so sought after, so pursued by heaven I don't get that, so I live like I want to live. And then sometimes, because we can have rebellious hearts too, it's just, I don't really care. And that's not me saying like, oh, we're terrible. It's me saying we're human. And that is the human condition apart from the Holy Spirit. For every single one of us. None of us are exempt from that. And Isaiah 
We have a verse that we're going to look at, 29, 13. It says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. God's calling it out. What's he calling out? A divided heart. And I don't know about you, but I, one thing that I know is that if my physical heart divides somewhere, we're in big trouble, right? If your spiritual heart is divided, wanting to serve God but fully serving your flesh, you're in serious trouble. And you don't even know. We don't mean to. We don't have bad intention. We love God. But it's easy to lose our devotion to him. The Bible talks about how God is seeking out the whole earth for someone whose heart is fully devoted to him. That's the difference. We look at people and we're like, wow, they are like powerhouse Christians. They are like are set on fire. Their gifts are flowing. They just like have a peace and a joy. Like what is the difference? Like how do I get there? A heart that's fully devoted. It's holiness. There is a power line between humans and heaven, and it's called holiness. And you can judge your holy meter. Some people, you know, be holy because I'm holy. Well, through Jesus, we're made holy, right? We can stand on that. But I can stand on the fact that I'm a mom because I've birthed two kids, and I'm about to birth another one. But if I don't act like a mom... What am I? It's the same in our Christian walk. You can say all the right stuff. You can do all the right stuff. You can show up at all the right events. But when you lay your head down at night, your devotion's going to speak loud and clear with what you do the next day. A lot of us, I'm a very passionate person. Passionate, it doesn't take a whole lot to get me excited about something. And so... I can really relate to this, but we have people who are like super excited about sports, right? Your sports teams are like your diehards. You know all the facts. You get super excited. If there's like a home run, a touchdown, a basket from your favorite team or a win, good Lord, like look out if you're sitting next to them. They're the ones screaming, jumping, dancing, probably not very well and losing their ever loving minds, not caring what anybody thinks because they're so excited about it. And that's awesome. I love that. But that same person can come into church where they get to serve the living God, the King of Kings, and praise him for what he has done. And they can't even open their mouth. And you sit there like this. You know? And it's like, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. And you're just like... Because someone might hear you or someone might think something about you. Well, someone's thinking something about you when you paint your face and your belly and you're jumping around, but you don't care. Then you have people who are on, like, really love politics. And politics are important. Let me reference that, okay? They really, really are so important. And we need people that care about that. But we know that the government rests on his shoulders, right? That he is in charge, ultimately. But we still need reform, and we still need policy, and we still need that. And and ultimately, we want that to reflect God as much as we can. And we all have a different opinion about that. But there are a lot of people that are super passionate about what they think should happen, right? You're super Republican, or you're super Democrat, or you just are super independent. And you know the way that we should do things, even though you're not in politics. And you are going to tell all of your social media about it. Or even face to face and we can get nasty and mean because we're passionate. But when it comes to being passionate about the Jesus who laid down his life, who set you free, who gave you grace and mercy to live the life and have the platforms you have, when it comes to talking about him, it's radio silence. So what that tells me is your devotion is to your political views and your fear of people knowing what you think about God and standing up for God And walking in righteousness and victory through your words for the kingdom of heaven is not a priority. It's, my devotion's not there. And we can justify that by personality. We can justify that by, like, oh, I just don't like to do that. Or 
or I'm afraid that people are going to come against me. Well, hello, everyone's coming against your political opinion and they don't, you don't care. Like, it's the same thing, but your devotion isn't there. And family, family is important. Family is a constitution created by God, right? Like he loves family and it's important to him and it should be important to us. But if your priority of your family makes it super easy for you to not show up on a Sunday morning because you gotta have a family day and you're just tired and I need alone time and I need to rest, I will tell you that you will never be more refreshed in your bed than you will at the altar in the presence of the Lord. And I'm not downing people for family time. I'm not downing that. But what I'm saying is how easy is it for us to just, oh, put God on the back burner. And one scary thing about that is it gets really easy the more you do it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't been here for four months. And wow, I don't know anybody here. And that doesn't make you bad. It's the nature of the human condition. But when are we going to be real enough with ourselves to look at our condition, to look at where our devotion is? Is your devotion to your job? Is your devotion to, you know, all the things we've already talked about? Where is it? Because it is somewhere. What makes you feel alive should point to where your devotion is. And when your devotion is not to God, it makes it really easy not to do what he wants because you don't feel it anymore, right? And we have all the justifications for it. So for instance, I was 29 years old when I got married. At 29, you are set in your ways. I loved God. I was in ministry. I... Uh, you know, did it all. But now I had to come into relationship and oneness with somebody else who did everything the opposite I did. And I am opinionated, and I'm going to tell you about that. And I have grown a lot. <laughs> but naturally, I don't submit. Naturally. And my husband, God love him, he was the little, he was the worship leader. And he's a great guy. <laughs> Genuinely amazing man. He hears the Lord. He loves so, so well. But when you see him, you're like, oh my gosh, look at that joy fountain. Like, he just smiles all the time. And he does. Like, it's real. He does. Sometimes I want to like, like this now is not the time. But, but when we first got married, nobody, and I didn't even know because I was dumb and I didn't know about marriage, even though I thought I did, but he is silently stubborn. And I'm going to be the one that like tells you and you're like, oh, look at that girl, like, whew. Um, but he's going to be the one that's like in the background, just like not moving his stance. And like making it impossible. And back seven years ago, that would bring out my fight. Because he wouldn't fight with me. And I was just fighting with myself. <laughs> but anyway, I don't like to submit, right? Naturally. God has done a huge work, and I'm so, so thankful for that. Um, but I don't like to submit. And I remember the first time in our marriage I had to submit. Like, and most people are like, well, you really probably should submit from day one. Yes. <laughs> should have. Didn't. Um, and it was over this issue about tithing. And we were both tithers, like no questions asked in our single lives and coming together. Like, absolutely. And I'm not telling you how you should tithe, but I'm talking about how we had to work some stuff out. <laughs> because I tithed every week. It was super important to me. But Dylan tithed different than me. And all of a sudden, he was like, how have you been tithing? Because I would just pay it online. And I was like, 10% or more every, every week. And he was like, no, like before the tax or after the tax? And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? And okay, like, first of all, math's not my jam. And he's like, always used to lloyd that over me. So I thought I was just confused. 
And he was like, no, like, 10% is before the tax. That's how we tithe. And I was like, if we do that, we're going to live in a homeless shelter. Because, <laughs> you know, we weren't living off a lot at that point. Newly married and all of that. And I was like, we can't do it. And I was like, dude, I'll, I will even tithe off our income tax. Like, I don't care. But this is how I've always done it. And I felt fine with the Lord by, like, taxing out the whole thing. I was fine. He was not. And so it turned into this big thing, and I was mad for days because he said the word, you need to submit to me. (laughs) What now? (laughs) And at that point, there was nothing that lit my fire like, you need to submit. So it was literally days, thank God, he uh, traveled for work at that time. (laughs) And so he would be gone for four days, and he would come back for the weekend. And uh, I had four days to wrestle. And I remember getting paid, and we, you know, like got the little notification that you've been paid, great. And so my instant reaction was always, you know, first I want to get that tithe out of the way so I don't spend it, right? And uh, sitting there in my car at Starbucks, the land of glory, And I really think it was subconscious or it was the Lord or something that I would need a fix after. And I sat there and I was like, he's not even going to know. He is not going to go look in our bank account to see how much money I paid the church. He's just going to look and see, yeah, okay, you know, the name of the church and whatever. Great. And I was like, he'll never know. (laughs) And he will have groceries to eat. And the longer I sat on that, I couldn't do it because I loved my husband. I may not want to submit to him. I may think he's wrong (laughs) or that it's not important and it doesn't matter because I felt fine with the Lord. But I loved my husband. When you love something, it changes your personality. It will trump your personality every time when there is true love as a motivation. So even though inside I was like, "Mm," I still was, I did what he said. And it is the same in reverse to the Lord. It's so easy to neglect intimacy with him, to neglect the word of God, to neglect the devotion that we need in order to change our human flesh. Because devotion and love for God is going to trump your personality. It's going to trump convenience. It's going to trump your flesh. And it's going to change you. Just like my flesh had to have some changing. And it took seven years. And I'm probably still not even good at it. You can ask him. I don't know. Um, But I will say, I submitted in that moment. We were uh, just about to have Ethan. And... Um, we both worked at that time and um, my my work was weird with maternity leave, all these like weird little things going on that was affecting our finances because of what was coming up. So I tied the way he said and was like, okay, there goes all the money. Um, And I get a call as I'm going on maternity leave that I had gotten a bonus of (laughs) $5,000. And I, I was like, I didn't even think I made my sales that month. I'm like trying to figure it out. Like, excuse me, what now? So got that. And then I get another phone call. And the lady's like, oh, hey, I forgot to uh, put this through HR. It just kind of got missed. But you should get about $5 an hour raise while you're out because you can't do sales. And so much of what we did depended on what we could do in, in it. And she's like, so your salary your, is, will be raised 5 bucks an hour through the remainder of your maternity leave, and we'll have to make it retroactive. <laughs> what? So we're just sitting there with all kinds of money because of my submission to my husband who submitted to the Lord who changed our hearts. So are you in love with Jesus? Do you feel something inside of your heart when you have to skip out on something God related or when we mess up because we're humans right so we will we'll mess up and we'll make mistakes 
but do we feel it? Or do we intentionally live in sin? Because we can, because we had God's chosen people de- devoted to God who had a rebellious heart, which is an intention. Is God pricking your heart and saying, maybe we need to get rid of something? Or maybe you're spending a little too much time over here. Or maybe you need to cut that relationship. Or maybe, 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 maybe. And you're just like, no thanks. I'm good. Me and God are good. And God's like, but we could be better. Praise God for grace. But there is something that happens when you decide that you no longer live in cheap grace. But you recognize and honor what was done for you and you live like it and you submit to the rules of the father that means you take your rights I had a right to pay my tithe the way I wanted to pay my tithe I submitted the right to the request of my husband because my priority was our relationship that's what it is you may have a right to do something it may not be that bad is it bringing you closer to devotion to your God if not it's our job to yield that So that God can do whatever he wants. And we are really bad at it. It's a sacrifice. It hurts. And the grace of God is so good. And God is so kind. But there's so much more of God that you could have. If there wasn't things in the way. And just because you might be blood bought, saved and on your way to heaven. Does not mean that he is God over your life. What would your life look like if you didn't fall into mediocrity and settling in your relationship with Jesus? What would it look like? I can tell you it would be fiery. It would be fulfilling. It would be peaceful. There would be joy. There would be power. There would be changes around you. You wouldn't be looking for answers because they would be open doors of favor and blessing and opportunity because that's the God we serve. But when there's something in the way, he can't give you that. When there's something in the way, he can only reach so far. And so this morning, I believe that God is calling a code blue and he wants us to look at our holiness levels. Hebrews 12 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's bold. That's, that's black and white. We can't wonder what he's saying. So if you this morning have felt like, I don't really hear God. I don't, I don't have this relationship that everyone's talking about. And I, I don't do this and I don't do that. And I haven't felt the presence of God. And when I go to the altar, he doesn't speak. How are you living? Holy? Because it's black and white, you won't see him if you don't. The people around you won't see him if they don't. It's so, so important. And what is holiness? It is mimicking the Father. It is living righteously. It is yielding our rights to what little bits we want to hold on to and giving it to God and allowing him to live through us. That is what it is. It is intimacy with the Father. It's deciding that a little bit of gossip in my life, it's not okay. A little bit of intoxicity isn't okay. A little bit of slander isn't okay. It's these little bits that are the symptoms of a heart attack. It is the little bits that will take you out every single time. It is, oh, well, my attention is a a little bit to God, but it's a whole lot to something else. Maybe if we got rid of the little bit, there would be room for our holy God to transform us. And it's called submission. And so this morning, I'm going to let the worship team come. One of the things that you can't miss in the media right now, obviously with all this DeMar stuff being talked about, is that they have said that the thing that saved his life was quick response. That the medical teams on the field responded really quickly. They didn't look around and be like, well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't remember. If I, no, no one does CPR every day. So I don't know if I can get it right. They didn't care. They just started it. And they did what needed to be done. And they say that's what saved his life. That's what gave the other teams time enough 
to do what needed to be done. And so this morning, I believe that God is calling for a quick response in the spiritual version of CPR is repentance. Repentance is what keeps our spiritual blood flowing. It keeps our spiritual heart alive, our eyes open, our minds clear where we can receive what God is saying because he so desperately wants to talk to you. He is saying stuff whether you can hear him or not. He's doing stuff whether you see it or not. But repentance isn't a one and done and that's sometimes how we live. We repented enough to get saved and we forgot about it along the way. Repentance is a, is a daily place where we live because we recognize, God, I can't live without you. God, your grace is more than just a covering to get me to heaven. Your grace is the empowerment to live righteously. And I can't do it. And I've tried. I've tried and I've tried. And I know there's people in this room where you're like, I'm struggling and I've tried and I've tried. Well, stop trying. Allow yourself to come to the Father with holy repentance. All that is, sometimes we get a little weirded out by it. We treat repentance like it's a Christian swear word, but in actuality, it is an invitation to intimacy. And that God's so excited about it. He's not mad at you. He wants you. He wants to administer grace. He wants to take your shame. He wants to clear your minds and give you a whole new second chance. And you know what? You might need him to do it again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that until you can defeat this thing. And that's okay because you can't defeat it without him. And so I'm calling the quick response. Code blue, the condition of your heart could be killing you. And if it's not killing you, you could probably feel a whole lot better. You could live with fire and passion and influence. You could impact the people around you. You could save your family. You could see things happen that have never happened before if we have a quick response. And so this morning, I don't care if it's a big thing or a little thing. If you can say, wow, I haven't heard the voice of God for a while. Or you're like, I feel so far from God, I don't even know how I got here. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We've all been there. But you need to come to this altar. You need the quick response time. You need to be refilled. We all need refilling. Life beats us up. It's hard, guys, and that's okay. But we need to be refilled because when there's something between us and God, there's, there's something filling us up that's not of him. So we need God to remove that thing so that he can fully pour his spirit out and the mercy that he's so eager to give you. And the clean slates that you can walk out of this building free and into your day tomorrow free and ready for it, whatever it is without guilt, without shame, without heaviness of heart, without the struggle without living in cheap grace, empowered and anointed. And so we're opening up these altars right now for a quick response, for spiritual CPR. And this isn't between us and anybody else. This is between you and God. Don't let the worry about what other people may think of you or the judgment, and none of that matters because quite honestly, most people aren't thinking about you anyway. But now is your moment. Don't miss it. 